Welcome to Words at Studio W. My name is Rian, and I'm from South Africa. Joining me at this table are four new friends. We are new friends because we have stories linking us both to Africa and to the United States of America. We have all met one another, and we are meeting one another in your company. Starting from this end of the table, we have Brian, also from South Africa. We have Oral from Ghana. We have Angelo from Kenya. And Lisa from Wallingford, Connecticut, but with a special story locating her in Africa. Storytelling is a great, great tradition. It's very typical in many African cultures. Everyone has a story. Around the world, all of us have stories. So, in getting to know one another, we are going to share some of our stories with ourselves and with you. And we'll start with Lisa. Thank you. I'm maybe not going to tell a very personal story, but um, a story that shows some of the joy I think that I experienced while living in certain countries. Uh, I remember one time we were in Namibia. This was around 1990, so it was a while ago. We were in a remote area, traveling on a gravel road for maybe 10 hours in the back of a pickup truck. And we were all picked up on the back of the road because there's no public transportation at that time. And so you're riding together with people kind of like we are now. Um, you know, people that you don't know, you get to know very well in a short period of time. And we stopped at one point um, in a very remote area. It's a small, small village. And one of the gentlemen we were riding with got out. And all of a sudden, his whole family came out. There were like 20 people. Then there were 50 people. Then pretty much everybody in the whole area came out, and he hadn't been home in a while, obviously. And just that kind of joy with um, his family and the neighbors and everybody that was there. And, you know, I was thinking, wow, that would be great if I came home, if I ever came home. <laughs> and, like, the entire neighborhood came out to greet me and was really happy that I was back. That's just, like, a small experience, yeah. Well, thanks for that. But now I have to ask you, mm. did you get that kind of homecoming when you no, came I back to the States? <laughs> yes, I did. No. <laughs> so did people come out to greet you? Kids no, the neighborhood. No, they did not. <laughs> we celebrated if you came home to Africa, yeah. as Brian and Oral and Angela and I surely hope we will be as well. Uh -huh. yeah. Which leads me to Angelo. Yes. Would you like to share a story with us? Okay, definitely, yes. Um, as you said, I'm from Kenya. I've been there all my life. I moved to the U.S. in 2001. Uh, back in Kenya, where I was born and grew up, the, the climate there is good. It's a country that has taught me a lot because uh, at the moment um, I've been doing some uh, carvings, as you see behind me and in front of us there. And uh, this is uh, from childhood, actually, I would say. Because back in... Um, uh, when we were children playing around in a village, you know, we could draw uh, pictures on the, on the sand. And, you know, our parents would, t would tell us, oh, look, now you have drawn a nice picture on the sand. Why don't you bring it out to, to the house now? But, you know, you cannot c carry a, a drawn picture on the sand to the house. So uh, it, it was a kind of a joy because then from there, it motivated me so much as I grew up to follow it up. So, so far now, I've been doing a little of um, carvings and some artwork. But this is uh, to supplement my, my main profession, because by profession, I'm an administrator. Back in Kenya, I used to work for the government as an administrator. I also worked in, uh, in, in Europe, based in Geneva, where I was in our embassy. This is kind of like a hobby, I would say. And... Uh, and it's because of my country, it, the resources are there, and um, I kind of, it kind of made me what I am today. So coming back, coming to the United States here, I've continued the same passion. So I believe all of us here are excited to see in front of you things that look like uh, they're living. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it is, and I, I appreciate it. Thanks, my chairman. Indeed. And as Angelo has, told, has shared with us, we are looking at his art. We are surrounded by his art, well insulated by his art, reminded of where his art comes from. And yet, Angelo tells us, art is not his, his first profession. 
You yeah. call it a hobby, but we see art, and you've given us something of a Genesis exactly. story here as well. Yeah. I'm rather sure the table is going to hold thumbs that at some point your description changes and something else becomes the hobby, yeah. and perhaps this becomes a full time profession. You know, like, you know, you have two hands. It's better to have two birds than having one bird. If you lose one, at least you have something <laughs> with you. So, as I said, uh, because um, as a hobby, a hobby is like a profession. It's complements, it's complementary, actually, I would say. Because uh, if you don't have a hobby, then you don't have a profession. If you don't have a profession, you don't have a hobby. So, so, I see, <laughs> so uh, I'm not down, downgrading my art, but I'm actually appreciating it. <laughs> there's something that, there's yes. a balance. Yes. Now, onto that, though, it did give your story something for oral to <laughs> try <laughs> and me. So oral, how do you follow Angelo and Lisa's stories? Um, Lisa's story is amazing. It tells you how welcoming the African continent is and you know Africans in general are very receptive of people and you know people who travel to Africa either for business pleasure or whatever. One of the first things they'll tell you is the smiles. And the, the kids especially, so full of love. I know in other countries there's this saying, stranger danger. But in <laughs> Africa, when kids see you, they just love you. Especially when they are told by, you know, maybe their parents or adults around that this is a very special person. They give you all the special treatment. And that, that makes it very welcoming for whoever is visiting, especially if they are not Africa. He said <laughs> something about his art that it's a hobby. My mother growing up would tell me, if you find something that you enjoy doing and you do it very well mm. and you master it, even if it becomes an, 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 an employment, you would work all day and it will not be work. You'll be having fun. You're literally getting paid to have fun. So yeah, what you enjoy doing, that becomes your hobby. If you're lucky enough to have it become your profession, you will not work a day in your life. Mm. You'll just be having mm. fun. <laughs> You know, so that was that was a cool thing about his story. Your story is amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I love the fact that you're still wearing your crown. The afro <laughs> is, is a crown, <laughs> you know. I, I have been trying to keep an afro since I was born, but for some reason, this section of my head decided to go on a long vacation. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't grow past where you see it right now. So I've... I've just come to accept the fact that it's part of, you know, who I am and, you know, just make use of what you have and let it work for you. I'm originally from Ghana in West Africa. I came to the U.S. in 2007. I came to pursue an internship with Voice of America in Washington, D.C. The reason I chose Washington, D.C. was because my dad had friends at the Voice of America in D.C., a wartime news era, which is now seeking to sell the American culture and tradition to folks outside America. And um, it was such an honor and a privilege for me to be accepted as an intern at the VOA. And um, when I got inside the VOA, I remember one thing that my friends back home were saying to me before I left. They're like, you're representing every single one of us. So go there and you bloody better shine. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you guys gotta come with me. Cause like, I feel like so humbled there are about a thousand and one people who could have done better than me, but for some reason I happened to be the one there and I I I went in there feeling like I'm carrying a lot of responsibilities on my shoulder. But as time went by and I was slowly easing myself in, I felt like it's an opportunity, you know. It's an opportunity to be who you want to be and let that person be encouraging to someone who is not there and let them feel like they want to be like you. But I always turn around and say to them, don't want to be like me, be better than me. <laughs> I'm going to just jump on something you said there, mm -hmm. just for one second. Or, uh, well, two things really, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to perhaps assimilate what the table is thinking right now. Um, you mentioned that you felt that there were so many other people that could have been in the position that you were in, right. which not to, to put too fine a spin on it, but it is almost a very familiar African way of thinking, mm -hmm. of, of privileging the community right. before the self. 
But now, having said that, you need to allow me to run with this because the community sure. that now is this table and anyone joining this conversation has only got one more question for you, and that is the device of photographs of you with hair. <laughs> Growing up as a kid, I had a lot of hair, and I was so proud of it. I actually wanted to lock my hair at some point in my life. But um, like I said, when I started hitting my 26, 27, mid-20s, this side of my head, <laughs> the hair on there took a long vacation, and <laughs> it's never returned. So, so I enjoy your fro when I see it. I'm like... This guy is wearing his crown and is wearing it very proudly. <laughs> Just on that, where I'm from, there are mixed feelings about the fro. And speaking of where I'm from, right. somebody else at the table shares a country with me. And we're from the same part of that country, from the Western Cape of South Africa. Brian. I was born, like Rihanna said, in, um, on the farm areas of uh, Paul area and uh, later moved to Cape Town. We moved to a place called District 6. And later on, we were forcefully removed, literally bulldozed out of that area mm. because they wanted to declare the white, put the white, you know, this, this beautiful area on the slopes of uh, Table Mountain overlooking the harbor, the ocean. We were sent into the boonies, <laughs> like little settlements there with no infrastructure. Just sand and little houses, no hot water, and we had to make a living there. You know, our parents were laborers, most of them, and uh, there were no places close by that to travel by train. More expensive. It was just hard, and uh, grew up there. And in 1991, I got um, I got an opportunity to come to the U.S. Um, with a uh, with a national team sport, so at that stage in time, um, we were still very much. I don't know if you're aware of it. Uh, some of my friends from Africa, you would know apartheid. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my goodness, yeah, it was that era. So I came over with uh, with a national team, which was like, you no, know, this this they would they never had a situation like that where. We traveled together, but I came here with a mandate, and that was to meet with the International Olympic Committee. Primarily, I had to sit with them and plead for acceptance back into the international arena because South Africa was cut off yeah. from international um, participation for 25 years at that time. Oh, into apartheid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 because of the laws and that. But I have still been involved with gymnastics. Um, I was coaching. I got all the opportunities, and I grabbed it, you know, against um, the, the, the rules at that time. You cannot do sport with white people until, you know, the government has changed. You cannot. You need to stay with blacks stay away from the whites i already got death threats too because i even played soccer for um in the white league mm -hmm. and i thought i would be safe because it was in the interior in Paul i played but some guys saw my name in the newspaper <laughs> playing for this team and i i, I got death threats that you know they know me and um, i must watch out right yeah yeah mm -hmm. So anyway, I came in 91 to the World Championships and I managed to convince the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, that, um, you know, gymnastics was very much alive um, in the areas. They've given us guidelines, the International Olympic Committee. This is what you need to do before you would even be considered to get back. Mm -hmm. And we um, aggressively developed the sport all over the country. And they liked that. And we were accepted back. First sport in South Africa, back into the international arena. Wow. And I... <laughs> oh, no, right? I, <laughs> I, I, I fell in love with the U.S. First time I came here. First time. And it was a culture shock, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it was a major culture shock. Um, the guy that I met first, who was in charge of... Um, Athlete Affairs, 
was a, a black brother. Right. And I'm like, what? <laughs> How come this guy can be in charge of such a huge um, event in my country? It's never, never seen, never heard of, you know? And then another blow to me is like, he's a lawyer. I'm like, what? <laughs> we never had any um, contact with our brothers, uh, you know, with the native blacks in, in, in the Western Cape. Um, the only uh, black guy that we saw in, in my uh, township that I grew up was the milkman. He came with his 20 dogs behind him <laughs> because the gangsters would take their milk. So they come in with a lot of dogs and they sell the milk. And, and that was the only black person, black person that we would uh, meet and talk to. That's it. We never went into... My parents always said, don't go in there, don't go in there. It was like, what does this mean? <laughs> I never had, it was just us in the township that played with one another. Mm -hmm. And we were called coloreds. You know, the government, they told us that we are coloreds. Mm -hmm. And then we had blacks, and then we had Indians, and whites, of course. So yeah, and then in 93, 92, 93, we decided to come over check the place out because by this time I got a lot of opportunities to come here and live here and work here and I was like man let's get the heck out of here <laughs> because life was still tough that time yeah you know we were still in our party era we finally decided that we're coming and then um, I got the opportunity to come but there was one thing that I wanted to experience and that is to vote in my country for the first time. So in 94, we could vote. And I wanted to experience that because prior to that, I was a number. We were just numbers in our country, you know. Uh, it, was, it was an awesome, awesome time. And uh, 95, I told my wife, let's go. So and you, in now. fact, voted. And yes. then from there, yes. you relocated to the United States. Mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something in your story, Brian, and if, if I have your permission, I will be using elements of your story in, in mine as well, because there's a, a sense of shared story mm -hmm. uh, with me very much taking my cue from you on this. Okay. But you mentioned perhaps one of the more famous examples of apartheid, spatial segregation during mm -hmm. the apartheid regime in South Africa, and that was the forced removals from District 6. And your story shares with us how, at one point, something that looked completely impossible, in one, in one way, your story ends, one part of your story ends with you casting your first vote in 1994, mm -hmm. the vote that, did it seem likely that you would get and arrive at that moment of casting your vote when you witnessed the, the removals from District 6? No. No, 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 I, because um, later on, you know, you could see the reason why that has happened, um, and that was just to further um, break that bond that we had, the, the, the community, into fractions, because some were sent over here, some were all over the place, and I mean, you know, that was to break us even further so that they can rule still, you know. Because it was it was a tight community there in uh, in District Six, very very tight community. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Inspired by the stories of our friends around the table, there are questions forming to me. The only because somebody decided to put me in a center seat. <laughs> <laughs> but each one of the stories we hear from our friends inspires a next set of questions. And before I ask that next next set of questions. I'll very briefly enter my story to the table, and it does dovetail somewhat with what Brian has already shared with us, but also to, to what all the friends around the table have said. I am from South Africa, I was born there, and I call myself a happy wanderer. I am in the United States most of the time to wander <laughs> and to meet fantastic people, which seems to be working out just fine. <laughs> At one point, I studied for one year at a college in North America, 
and I developed something of a feel for the place, but I'll elaborate on that a little later. For now, I was born, I should probably reference this, three years before Trevor Noah. <laughs> and like him, I, I saw the last phase of apartheid. I was too little to be overtly impacted by it, but I saw, there's a word story again, I saw the stories that people carry from apartheid, and I've memorized them, and we've heard Brian share of his story. You'll hear some of the stories going around the table. So well, now I'm a, an academic working at Stellenbosch University in the Cape Winelands. And as such, my work informs my need to wander and travel. And it so happens that I'm traveling along the northeast of the United States and I'm encountering these friends with their stories. And on that, I have to turn back to Lisa. And if you will, Lisa, <laughs> Share with us your connection to Africa from the United States. My connection is based on my work. I worked in Namibia several years as an English educator. And most recently, I was um, principal or academic director at an all-women's college in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, I worked there for four years. I just came back recently. I've spent six or seven years of my life um, there. And the story that I told was a very small uh, example of so many amazing um, experiences that I've had there and so many wonderful, inspiring people that I've met. I have to maybe say that that story doesn't represent um, all of my experience, that I don't want to give the impression that countries in Africa are all remote, small villages. Mm -hmm. So many things, and I hope we talk about that a little bit, um, just thriving um, city, communities and so many inspiring social entrepreneurs and so many amazing things that are going on in there um, on the continent right now. Um, that, that's, my, that's my background. Immediately, I just have to ask you, is there a particular memory of your teaching and your schooling experience that stands out for you at this point? Wow, that's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, off, off the top of my head, just the mere fact that you're in an all-women's college is a big deal, you know. To me. That was a, that was must, a big privilege. Have, yeah, it must yeah. have been very, you know, humbling. It was very <laughs> humbling. The students that I worked with, very inspiring. They worked five times harder than I did, I think, when I went to school. 90% of our students were supporting another family member at the time. So paying for school fees for the younger sister or, or another family member. It's hard for me to, <laughs> to pinpoint one, one, one sort of story. Yeah. Four years in that role, and as you've, as you've shared with us, it gave you exposure to stories, once more, that your students are bringing and being the involvement of the stories. In your role as an educator, how strongly do you find the connection, at least the awareness of it, the stories and the context and the, the geographical and cultural movements of your students are in your work and how... How do they stay with you, especially when you find yourself back in your home country and you have to think back to these moments? Oh, there are many things. So, so whenever you go to a new culture, and um, for me, there's um, always a certain wisdom there that you learn that you don't get from your own culture. And so, so just learning the way that people approach things, the way that people give you advice, mm -hmm. for example, like um, at least in, I don't know if I can say around East Africa, but in Rwanda, um, People really respect um, elder people in their family. And they would listen to any advice that you would give. And that yeah. was the way that people learned and made decisions of, of what they wanted to do. Um, so, so that was one of the things. Also, the way that people learn. And going back to that, um, you know, how we developed the education system in the school. It was um, an English-only model and maybe some aspects that weren't traditionally um, done in the area, but you had to look at, well, how are people taught when they're children? And a lot of it is storytelling, going back to stories, like storytelling, being given advice by people in the family, anecdotes that were they had to discern this is the right way or the wrong way to do something. And so how do you implement that in the educational system um, so that students are still familiar 
um, with the way that they learned at an earlier age and still maybe adding in some other elements that they're not familiar with. I guess if that answers the question. That's a very <laughs> profound answer and illuminating as well. I'll be riffing on that with you at some point. Uh, very quickly, I might just want to ask Angelo, yes. in terms of how you describe your career and the work you do, what might be the most immediate aspect of that you'd care to share with us? Okay. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, I have two careers, I would say. There's a hobby uh, career and there's my professional career. So, um, in my other career, like the professional career at the moment where I work, I work as an, um, I work in um, a medical uh, industry where we, we manufacture um, this medical equipment. And um, I do, I do what, uh, assessment of those uh, equipment they are, they are produced and I direct. Uh, and I enjoy it because it, the idea is, you see, uh, back in my country, let me get back. Back in my country, as I said, I was an administrator. But when we moved here, it was not easy to get fit, get into that profession directly. So we had to, to, to go for the training and do something. And that's when now I got so much involved in this uh, hobby thing of mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because so when we moved here, we thought maybe we could just fit in in our profession. But it took so long. So in the process now, I developed this hobby of mine and perfected it. To answer your question directly, I enjoy it and uh, it, it has given me a result. Because of that vacuum, when I moved in here and I could not fit in my profession, so I. I reverted to my hobby, and that's mm -hmm. now that's why you see now I'm able to bring forward to you something that's tangible and pleasant. Thank you very much, Andrew. On that, we we'll leave you with a visual of Andrew's artwork. Thank you.